stroke on one page. Please, read a disclaimer before continuing. This is the map that we will follow during this presentation. It contains a thought process on diagnosis, management and prevention of stroke. So let's get going with stroke in one page. Once we identify that the patient is having acute stroke-like symptoms there are a series of steps taken immediately to maximize the potential, the potential outcome and minimize the injury and complications. Such as, allow for the systolic blood pressure to be within the range of 120 to 220 millimeters of mercury. Check the ABCDs, place patient flat to improve the arterial perfusion to the brain. Do not place the patient in the Trendelenburg position. Get the point of care glycemia peripheral IV access. Collect blood samples for tests, keep the patient NPO, and notify neurology right away. For inpatient suspected acute stroke, call the rapid response team as they haven't run the acute stroke inpatient protocol. Then, there are several key questions we need to address right away. Which ones are the symptoms? We can triage beginning with the BFAST scale. Next is to figure out when the patient was last known to be at baseline. The question is not when the symptoms were first noted or found, but when was the patient last seen at neurologic baseline last? Then, measure the intensity or degree of the deficit. The most common tool for this is the NIH stroke scale. This score will help support the decisions that we will be making of IV and or endovascular therapies. A parallel and simultaneous question is, are the symptoms of the acute stroke disabling? Also, we will need to figure out the pre-stroke functional status of the patient. For that, we use the modified Rankin scale. This score will also help us make or, make or support the decisions that follow. Please, familiarize yourself with the modified Rankin scale. If we're going to consider the patient for IV alteplase and or endovascular therapy, the contraindications for the treatments need to be reviewed. If the patient is still having symptoms, then we will need to get a non-contrasted head CT scan done immediately. The main reason is to document that the symptoms are not due to an acute hemorrhage in the brain. Remember, that the CT scan does not detect most acute ischemic strokes. Before placing the patient on the CT table, get his or her body weight. If the last known normal was less than four and a half hours, then the patient may qualify for IV tenecteplase if the stroke symptoms are disabling. Start checking the vital signs at least every 15 minutes, if not more frequently, as judged necessary. To give IV tenecteplase the goal systolic blood pressure should be between 120 and 185. Some recent publications suggest that, the best blood pressure range for an acute stroke in the first 24 hours seems to be between 140 and 100. If stroke symptoms are disabling, and the patient is within the first 24 hours, and the NIH stroke score is 6 or greater, and the modified Rankin score is 0, 1 or 2, then we would be thinking about performing a CT angiogram of the neck and brain. We include the neck to explore the arterial anatomy for the potential endovascular navigation to come. Patient to come. If there is ACT a target, such as LVO, as in M3 or before, for endovascular therapy, then ordering a brain CT perfusion would be the next step. In patients with stroke symptoms, who have an NIH stroke score 6 or greater, and a modified Rankin score of 0, 1 or 2, and are within the first 6 the decision may be made by neurology to go straight to endovascular therapy. In some circumstances, such as in wake-up strokes or unknown last known well, then neurology may consider ordering CTA and CTP, as these patients may still be candidates for endovascular treatment. But, every effort should be made for the patient to get only the test should be made for the patient to get only the test that will benefit them. For example, if the acute stroke symptoms are not disabling, and an NIH stroke score less than 6, then neither CTA nor CTP are indicated. Or, if there is no alveol in the CTA, then there is no need for CTP. If the stroke symptoms have cleared, that is the patient TIA, or if the symptoms are older than 24 hours, the better initial test may be the MRI of the brain, and may consider to forego head CT scan altogether. Following the acute decision making, the thought process moves forward identifying the mechanism for the ischemic stroke. There are essentially three basic mechanisms for an acute ischemic stroke. Mainly, the pipes, the pump, or the plasma. The pipes can be divided into small and large arteries, and less commonly the veins. The best test for pipe imaging is the CT angiogram, followed by carotid ultrasound, followed by MRA with contrast, and lastly MRA without contrast. The main area to image is the carotid artery, as there is the potential option of carotid and arterectomy. If on the same side of the stroke there is stenosis between 60 and 99 percent. Outside of the decision making for endovascular therapy within the first 24 hours, the decision to image intracranially needs to be thoughtfully made. As of 2022, 
there is very little there is very little opportunity for intracranial endovascular procedure for secondary stroke prevention the management for intracranial arterial stenosis is medical this may change in the future from the pump perspective that is from the heart the two most common sources of cardioembolism are atrial fibrillation and severe CHF. Less commonly valvular, valvular disease, endocarditis or intracranial tumors may be the culprits. Stroke from cardioembolism is frequently prevented with anticoagulation. Sources of a stroke from the plasma are a lot less common, and they include hypercoagulable state, hyperviscosity states, and others. Most hypercoagulable states are venous, which were right to left shunt for stroke generation. Hypercoagulable states can lead to cerebral venous thrombosis. A lot less commonly arterial hypercoagulable states are diagnosed. The management of hypercoagulable state may include anticoagulation. If the workup is completed, and no convincing source is identified, then it's, Im then it's important to consider the diagnosis of cryptogenic stroke. One of the important tools in this situation is long-term cardiac rhythm monitoring. This decision may be ready to be made after 24 hours after admission. Of note, in acute ischemic stroke, aspirin should be initiated within 48 hours of arrival to hospital, or before the second mic and midnight, as per the Joint Commission, and is not an emergency to administer in the emergency room. For secondary stroke prevention, identifying the modifiable risk factors is important. Some of the modifiable stroke risk factors are chronic arterial systemic hypertension to be treated to a long-term systolic blood pressure goal of 110 to 130, atrial fibrillation, smoking, sedentary lifestyle, sleep apnea, dyslipidemia, diabetes mellitus, illicit drug use, and poorly managed stress. In cases of TIA or of acute stroke with NIH stroke score of 4 or less, and if initiated within 48 hours from onset of symptoms, then it is indicated to, is indicated to use dual antiplatelet therapy for 3 weeks to 3 months, after which, continue a single antiplatelet agent. Initiate statin therapy, irrespective of the cholesterol profile level, unless there is a contraindication. By the way, any treatment or step not done, needs to be documented in the medical note, providing the rationale for eating from the expected provision of stroke care. Identifying the risk factors helps to deploy strategies specific, as well as generic, for secondary stroke prevention. About 80% of the strokes are ischemic, and the remaining 20% are intracranial bleeds. The most common location and mechanism for intracranial bleed is the deep intraparenchymal hemorrhage secondary to chronic hypertension. Intraparenchymal hemorrhages are managed by neurology. When the bleeds are outside the brain, such as subarachnoid hemorrhage and SDHs, they are managed by neurosurgery. In the management of intracranial bleeds, some steps to remember are to place the head of the bed up 30 degrees as that is a point of balance between arterial perfusion and venous drainage to help maintain the intracranial pressure, at the same time as decreasing the pressure head on the ruptured vessel. As with ischemic stroke, aim for normal blood volume, as hypovolemia or hypervolemia increase morbidity and mortality. Avoid using albumin or lactated ringers, and prefer using normal saline infusion. The goal systolic blood pressure in the first 24 hours should be between 120 and 160 millimeters of mercury. Antihypertensives such as labetalol and nicardipine, and other agents, are commonly used. Some important red flags in acute stroke are, Glasgow Coma Score 13 or less, Glasgow Coma Score declining by more than 2 points, and ICH Score of 3 or greater, and NIH Stroke Score of 10 or greater, and ABCD2 Score and TIA of 4 or greater. Spontaneous subarachnoid hemorrhage which is likely to be aneurysmal and poses the risk of re-bleeding. Interventricular hemorrhage, large subdural hematomas, or hemorrhage of 3 or more centimeters in diameter, clinical or imaging evidence of cerebral herniation, fever, facial diparesis, disconjugate eyes, forced eyes deviation, and the presence of coagulopathy. In stroke, either ischemic or hemorrhagic, there is no indication for prophylactic anticonvulsant, corticosteroid use, intracranial stents, or with very few exceptions the use of heparin. Also, remember to use normal saline and not albumin, nor lactated ringer. Those clinicians taking care of stroke patients in the emergency room or in the hospital must be versed in the following stroke-related scores or scales. The NIH Stroke Scale, the Modified Rankin Scale, NIH Stroke Scale, the Modified Rankin Scale, and the Glasgow Coma Score. The physicians and APPs should also be versed on the ABCD2 score, ICH score, CHADS2 score, the Hunt-Hess classification, and the New York Heart Association classification.
It goes without saying that the NIH stroke score is the de facto nation for patients with acute stroke symptoms. In the link in the description below, a YouTube video reviews the NIH stroke score in about 10 minutes. There are online tools to get training and certification on it too. I hope this short educational overview will help you think through the general steps that should be considered when taking care of acute stroke patients. Please, review the disclaimer in the description. In the description, you will also find links to some of the relevant bibliography.